Welcome to Bramall, uh, just close to Manchester, here in England. And we're outside Bramall Hall, uh, here with Andy Doran, uh, who... Uh, Andy, you started your policing career here. Yeah, not Some... too far. I was living down here when I first started 16 years ago, uh, in the borough of Stockport, and they posted me to Wigan. Uh, so I was travelling to Wigan every day, uh, which is a great place to work, but not a great place to travel to from Stockport. So, former Greater Manchester officer, That's right. who moved then to Lancashire, That's right. Uh, yeah. and now on to Salesforce. And we're yeah. going to explore something of that uh, career over the last nearly 20 years uh, as we walk from this beautiful building, um, some, I think, 500 years old or something like yeah, that. Yeah, a good 500 years old, yeah. And uh, some beautiful grounds ahead of us, I, I believe. So. Um, Greater Manchester officer, yep. um, moved to, to Lancashire after how many years? So uh, just about nine years in Greater Manchester. Uh, I came straight from university uh, into GMP, and great place to work. Uh, loved my time there. Uh, it was a time of austerity where we were coming to, and I always wanted to test actually what's policing like in another force, and how can I put myself out of my comfort zone and move to another force to do that. Uh, and it was the best thing that I ever did, moving to Lancashire in that way because you lose your credibility, you lose your network, and you have to build all of that up again from scratch. Uh, and it's a real test of character and a test of your own resilience. And it was great for, for personal development. Yeah, I, and I love my time across both forces. And I left policing, and we'll come on to, but left policing with a, no bad regrets. It was a, the best time of 16 years. And taking a career break uh, allowed me to do something a little bit different now. So, uh, moving to, to Lancashire, so you then uh, moved um, through the force uh, and um, ended up as the um, chief inspector leading on uh, digital and innovation, I believe. Yeah, that's right. In, and a, in a force that has quite a, repu a strong reputation on both those fronts. Yeah, uh, and you know, as a detective, I never thought my career would end up in that space. Uh, I definitely never thought as a detective my career would end up anywhere near a control room. Um, and at points uh, at that at that stage, you reflect on what's gone wrong. <laughs> but do you know it was the why best thing that, that ever why happened? Do you, why do you reflect on because what's gone wrong? Because I never joined the police to then go into a controlled environment. But that was my naivety. That was my lack of understanding, actually, of how important a control room is in a policing environment. It's the beating heartbeat of a police organisation. But I didn't know that before you go into it. But, uh, but less opportunity to, to put sort of hands on yeah, uh, but, but collar criminals and there and is that. And actually you, do well. you learn that the people doing that job, it's even harder for them because they can't get hands on. So when you go to a job and you deal with a job, at least you'll be able to affect an outcome. Uh, but yeah, we'll come into a little bit more around the control room. But in, in terms of ending up as a chief inspector lead for digital innovation, fantastic. But the detective background gives you that problem solving. Policing gives you that problem solving. And all innovation is, is taking a problem, finding a solution, and integrating that solution to make it better. Uh, you might not fix something completely, but as long as you can make it better. Uh, and Martin Hewitt talks uh, a lot Martin about... Martin Hewitt, now the um, National Police Chief's uh, Council uh, Chair. That's right. And he talks about actually innovation, change, particularly digital change. If you can't make it better for staff, don't bother. It has to be about making it better for staff so they can do the job that they come to work every day to do which is around making it better for victims and for the public. And so you, you moved uh, into the um, control room at Lancashire, uh, perhaps slightly frustrated that that's where you were heading. Um, and, and then, so what happened whilst you were involved in, in the control room then? What, what, yeah. what differences did you and your colleagues make to the control room in your time there? Yeah, so as a detective you and as a police officer, uh, your job is to find out the truth. Uh, and actually, I'm a bit like a dog with a bone, so when you get hold of a problem, uh, you want to solve it and understand it. But the best thing was we took a different approach. So we actually took people from the work, so practitioners from the work. Uh, we had call takers, dispatchers, team leaders, response officer, detectives, a multi-skilled team that we brought together to understand what is a very complex environment. And we started by trying to understand demand. And lots of forces, every force has done this in, in some guise. But we took a statistical sample and listened to 1,200 calls. And of those 1,200 calls, we very quickly started to work out that at the time, 60% of those calls for the one-on-one -on -one service weren't logged. Not logged? Not logged. So they sit as an audio file on a server, and actually we don't fully understand in policing, or we didn't at this stage, what they contained. 
So we always focus on the things that we can see, the things that are logged, and we try and reduce demand or manage demand in that way. But when you're only taking in 40, 45% of your demand that you can see, any business that couldn't see that other part of the demand would start to struggle. So why, why wouldn't they be, be logged then? So these demands are things like, I called up yesterday to report a crime or an incident. I've not heard anything. What's oh, going on? Okay. And for Lancashire, they get 209,000 of those or so every year. So that's one in five of the overall total demands. A massive, massive chunk. When you look nationally, that's replicated. So this is sort of failure demand in that it is. Um, the, the individual contacting the police again because they haven't had an update, keen to have an update, yep. they're not reporting the original incident or concern or, or whatever. It's just what's happening. That's what they want that's to know. That's right. What's going on? Or can I have my property back? Can I find out if somebody's in custody? Can you put the through to the department? I want to speak to the officer. All these things that are coming in and you have a really, really skilled and passionate workforce that sit across policing and that's no different than a control room. Phenomenal people that we have to do a phenomenal job every day. But what we get them to do as well is answer all these questions that not one of them can actually provide the victim or member of the public an update with. So they have to pass it on back to the officer or back to the police staff member that sits at the front line. So a good example of where the individuals are doing their utmost to provide an outstanding service but that the system doesn't support them in quite the way or perhaps even anything like the way in which it could. Absolutely. And the danger of that is then the narrative and national paradigm becomes demand is unprecedented. And we're talking often about telephony demand here. But when you look at that uh, and the telephony demand, uh, that's one side of it. You've got the digital contact then as well. But with digital contact and telephony combined, it is starting to really creak the system from a policing point of view. There are so many different ways of, of contacting or engaging with policing now, for, from telephony, as you uh, have mentioned, through yep. to social media, uh, through to um, uh, text, uh, different uh, challenges in, or different opportunities, I should say, in identifying the location of the call, uh, making sure that uh, if, if the call is coming in from a mobile, uh, it has location associated with that call. That's right. And so there's an opportunity to make much more use from all that data that's available. There is, and that big data that sits behind it, it's using that then to really define the problem. And once we understand the problem, we can then start to work on that rather than sometimes on the symptoms that sit around that problem. So there you, there you were working away on this uh, in Lancashire with, with your colleagues, uh, very much focus, focusing again. So digital and innovation was your particular remit. And I can yep. see how that absolutely would fit with control room and yep. no doubt other areas as well. So uh, had you any dealings with your with your current employer at that stage? Had Salesforce um, come on the horizon at that stage? Nope. You, were, you were using other um, tools that were available uh, to, to help you and colleagues improve the service that was on offer. Absolutely. I'd never even heard of Salesforce. Uh, and this time last year, I had heard of Salesforce, but I wasn't thinking of leaving policing. I thought I'd have been a 30 year career police officer, uh, passionate about policing. It's here, policing sits here for me. Um, and to be where I am now uh, is fundamentally different, but still helping policing just in a different way. Well, let's just say a few words about Salesforce, because I'll be frank with you. I, I, I've worked quite a while in policing and a year ago, I don't think I'd heard about <laughs> Salesforce either. Yeah. Um, and yet they are a very substantial company yeah. um, with um, quite a significant um, level of support to policing, but yes. ju just not in the UK. Yeah, and, and probably about an 18 month journey for Salesforce in the UK, from a policing point of view. Um, there are around three and a half thousand plus government stroke policing organisations across the globe that use Salesforce. Salesforce though, uh, came to being through the commercial world. And if you think 92% of the Fortune 500 companies use Salesforce, over two thirds of the FTSE 100 companies use Salesforce, and that's around CRM predominantly. So t CRM, you explain yeah. the um, so customer relationship management, but, right. but unwrap that and yeah. explain what it is. So if you think what we want from a victim point of view in policing is to understand that journey that that victim goes on. At the moment, we push victims often through silos. So from contact into operations, into investigation, through into partners, and ultimately, if it goes that far, into the court system as well. But that's all cut up into different segments. What Salesforce does is bring that together. So you get one view of that victim, 
and for the victim they go on a journey that they're updated throughout from contact to closure and where CRM is a big part of Salesforce's offering and that's what we excel at across the world we have a part we have a, a family of, of products that actually is a platform uh, and is a strategic platform for policing that I think can transform how policing currently does what it does so you it, it was once fairly recently described to me as a, a Salesforce having um, a collecting the different nuggets of information uh, and um, making those available to um, policing and partners yep. with appropriate permissions, yep. you know, protecting the data um, in a way that actually facilitates the the, the next steps that that uh, seeks appropriately to to automise some of that so that. Um, there aren't bottlenecks in the system. Yeah. Um, so, so that collection of data and the real value that it provides, um, Salesforce um, provides that analysis and that support, um, and and works with forces um, to to improve the the service to victims, witnesses, to to citizens. Yeah, and it's why I left. So. It's like why, it's why earlier, you left Lancashire. Hang on, let's just yeah. <laughs> explain that. It's why you left. So you, you left Lancashire because yeah. you felt that the Salesforce offering was... Well, the reason I left Lancashire is because I got to a stage with a team where we, we actually understood the problem that was policing was facing from a demand point of view and from a contact point of view. Now, if you get that right, everything else after that point starts to work really well. If you don't get that right, everything else is difficult to recover. So you understood the problem. So we understood the problem. I then went and Andy Rowe, Brilliant. The chief then said, "Okay, Andy, this chief is great." Chief Constable of Lancashire now, now uh, leading on um, uh, Oscar Kilo, the, right. the, um, the well-being yeah. support for policing nationally. That's right. And he asked the perfect question. We've got all this information. We've got all this insight. So the question is, so what? So what next? How do we stop this from happening? How do we transform the victim journey? And actually, I came up with a 16-point plan with the team, and found it very, very difficult. To implement any of it there's a lot of great systems out there a lot of systems that policing use but they're often point to point they're often siloed themselves and actually they're not often powerful enough to do what we need to do because i didn't have that ability to change in one force what i saw nationally for policing in terms of how we change i had to step out and there's an irony to that an irony where i have to step out of policing to change from outside to then step back in but so, I, yeah it so, became like a life purpose so th th there you are. You're, you're looking at, from Lancashire um, at at what is on offer, um, and you know there there are some excellent systems and, and ways of doing things uh, yeah. out there in in private sector uh, and indeed public sector. The, the public private partnerships very po can be extremely powerful. Yeah. So um, Salesforce at that stage wasn't on your radar or or was it had you spotted salesforce as a part of your research yeah, as so to what was available alan todd who chairs the national contact management steering group and does a, does a great job nationally for policing around contact uh, he kind of invited uh, lancashire police uh, and all police forces to that national contact management steering group meeting and it was during this that, was about a, a, a year 18 months ago yeah, something like that that's right and at about that time uh, salesforce presented at that national meeting and i was sat there as a digital lead in policing for Lancashire and I saw their market share for CRM and for some of the platforms that they've got and world leader in this space and I never heard of them <laughs> so I was thinking what am I doing how do I not know about these people so I started researching them I started to look at actually how could that a computer cross into policing and that's where I saw the power of that technology uh, and this is driving the biggest and best business across the world in terms of how businesses keep customs updated so I thought, well, if they can keep customs updated so well, why can't we keep victims updated equal to that? Uh, because for business, it equals money. For victims, it equals safety. And I would argue, more importantly, we can need to keep victims safe. So they should also have the best technology to enable policing to do that. So you put aside your warrant card. I did. Uh, you then took what I, I imagine was a, something of a leap of faith, because there you are, you've you described 16 17 years yep. in policing with your warrant card yep. an expectation of 30 um, not not every police officer um, views the private sector with uh, the, the the most favorable um, no. impressions no. and and yet there you were you you were making that change into something that certainly 
wouldn't have had the same job security as no. you would have expected to have in Lancashire. No, and it was for that warrant card and for what symbolises and for what I've loved and known for the last 16 years, I have to say it's probably the hardest decision I've ever made. Uh, and that decision that I made was actually because I think all of us have to have a bigger purpose than, our, than ourselves. And although my passion is always starting policing, I know that until we fix this problem, we're always going to be going over old ground. Uh, and the technology that we currently had in policing couldn't achieve what we need to do. And that's why I thought, okay, I take a career break, I went on holiday, it took about 10 days for me to make a decision and I went backwards and forwards, one day I was, no I'm not leaving, the next day I was leaving uh, and I thought, do you know what, I have to do it, I have to go and try. So an itch, an itch though that you had to scratch. Because and I know how profound it can be and the changes it can make for policing are massive. And a change to, to family as well. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, this is, this is not just a question of you um, doing what you have to do, but consideration for others as well in that. Absolutely. I, I said to my little boy, I've got a three-year-old and another one on the way. I said, what do you think daddy should do? Do you think he should be a police officer or should I go and work for Salesforce? And he said, be a policeman. So I thought, right, uh, that's one advice that I can, uh, I can look at. <laughs> I wonder where that was going when you started that, sort, that story. <laughs> but it's hard because family is so proud of what you do. And it's the only thing that from a, from a, from a boy to now, policing was the only thing I ever wanted to do. Uh, so to make that decision to leave, and hand that warrant card in was massive. The, um, so, yeah. so many people uh, join work in policing because of a public service yeah. um, ethos and, yeah. and their desire to do the right thing by society. Absolutely. And, and so you've, you saw, it sounds, that you were able to take that ethos and apply it within private sector. Yeah, and that's the thing that keeps me going uh, because I still had to have that bigger purpose uh, and coming to Salesforce, I have to say I've been blown away just by them as an organisation uh, and how they communicate across the world, 76,000 staff, and how they keep those people engaged to drive towards the same common purpose. I've been able to take my passion for policing and go into there and actually work every day at solving some of these big issues. So, in a way, I found it easier to move to Salesforce than I did to transfer between forces, uh, which again is quite ironic, but I do think that Salesforce as a company, Salesforce as an organisation, their principles, their values around actually giving back and using business as a platform for change is one of the, also the big reasons that I selected them. Well, so best very, technology and best place to work in the UK. And so. they're very lucky to have you as well because I've, I've seen uh, at least a couple of your presentations on this topic, formal presentations, where your passion, your your determination, your drive to make a difference really comes across. So um, I'm not asking for you to comment on that, but I just, um, if those watching haven't yet seen Andy Doran um, presenting, it's well worth, it's well worth um, taking the opportunity. I so, think it's, it's really important to say on that though, that that is the power of a team. To bring all those people from that different skill set, different diversity of mind together to solve what is a very complex problem, that's where the power came from. This isn't all my thinking, this isn't all my ideas, this is a team that, that presented these ideas. I just thought, I have to go and find that solution for it. And, and uh, you know, here, here we're talking about um, uh, aspiration. What about delivery? Yep. So, so have, have you yet been able to deliver uh, any part of what you had been hoping to deliver? Yeah, so we're working with a force at the moment where some funding is being provided. And actually, this is so exciting. Not it's, able to say which force at this moment. Not at the moment, yep. but that, that force, I want that force to be able to do that. Yes. Because uh, what we do at Salesforce isn't about us. It's the reason that Salesforce is so successful is because it's about the customer. It's about making them successful and in policing terms, so they can make the victim successful and the victim outcomes really good. So actually, from that piece of work, that allows us to mark out and plot out that victim journey from contact to closure. So. I, Whilst it's completely different in some respects to the likes of Amazon and the likes of those services where you don't have to pick up the phone to find out what's going on, it's the same principle. How do we keep victims updated across time and space and across their channel of choice to keep them safe and feeling safe? And that for me is a really, really key piece of work around that. But we're speaking to over 30 forces now around how we engage across different parts of policing because it's not just about the front end, but that's where it starts. If we get that right, as I said earlier, we can make a massive, massive difference. So 30 forces in England and Wales, potentially in, in the 
the, the British Isles. Yeah. But um, with Salesforce having a footprint uh, very much further afield than that. And yeah. so uh, you've, you've, you describe with passion your, the positivity that you have in moving from, um, uh, as a police officer, moving into private sector. And I've had the privilege of, of, of talking and indeed recording uh, a number of similar policing friendship tour interviews with others who've made that journey. Yeah. But it's, it, it's not, I know it's not for um, every no. former police officer, it's not for every officer mid-career uh, to make that change. What, what sort of tips might you have for those that are thinking that, you know, not sure whether mid-service, 15 years here, yeah. here in the UK, um, not sure whether they're going to stay around for the 30 years yeah. um, and, and looking at other opportunities. What would, what would your thoughts be on that? Yeah, I would, I would first start by saying, think really hard about what you want to do uh, in life, in your career, what you want to achieve, uh, and how you can help other people to achieve as well. I think what the College of Policing uh, aimed to do when they looked at people exiting the organisation, coming back into the organisation, is actually a really good idea. I think policing has got so many good skills, and as individual police officers and members of police staff, sometimes we don't realise what we can offer and what we do bring. Uh, and it's very easy to sit back and go, well, I've got a pension and actually this is me for a period of time. But how do we keep current? How do we keep really on top of our games? So if we do go back into policing, which is my intention going forward. You've described it as a career break. Absolutely. So this is, this is um, it, it's not forever no. necessarily in the no. private sector. So how do we then take those skills we've learned to then further enhance policing when we go back in? So careful consideration, but uh, there, there is a world outside policing, but there of is. course, um, society needs uh, those in policing to to please stay in. Absolutely. Um, at the moment, uh, the the proportion of uh, officers with, I think, under two years or but very very few years of service is is quite substantial in the it UK. Is. So something like twenty, maybe even twenty five percent of. The full police officer complement yeah. um, is, is made up of officers who've joined within the last two to three years. So, absolutely, an, an enormous challenge for experienced officers to support the training uh, of those those new uh, officers. Um, I'm, I have no doubt that 99.9% .9 of those new officers will have their hearts absolutely in the right place, but yes. they, they won't have that experience that that comes from. Um, uh, you, you know, just time served, if you like. Yeah, uh, so I remember being an officer with 12 months service and, and two years and three years service. And you know what? They are our front line. They do an amazing job. And sometimes we go because you have only got two or three uh, years experience. But they've got two or three years experience in that one dedicated field often. And they become very specialised and very effective at doing what they do. Which, th which brings us back, of course, to the control room. Because yeah. the control room is in so many ways they're lifelines it sometimes is. literally so absolutely and the the, the information that um, the control room provides to their officers may be attending uh, a, a scene an incident where um, information timely information is precious yeah you know you you want as a police officer attending to know uh, let's say whether whether the the address that you're attending is known to have firearms, registered firearms on the property. Absolutely. You want to know that yeah. before you knock on the door or seek to force entry. Yeah, and you think the purpose of the control room should be to record accurately, to enable the people in the control room to make good decisions, and ultimately to keep the public safe and officers safe. So officers and police staff on the front line to keep them safe too. And actually that's why technology should work and be an upstander rather than a bystander to these big critical problems across the UK and the world. And actually that information you've talked about, such as firearms licensing, uh, and how you surf that information quickly and accurately to keep people safe. That's where technology companies have to enable policing, rather than what often happens is things are promised and they're not delivered. Or things are promised and you don't always get what you ask for. And then you're left sometimes in a worse position from a policing point of view than where you started out. And I think technology companies have got a big piece of work to do with policing, because I think policing would have been burnt quite often. As a consequence of that, they don't trust a lot of the providers because the promises have never came out into actual outputs that benefit policing. And that's where we are different because our so software as a service uh, offering, you're not buying some hardware. This is, this is a software as a service that's managed across the cloud. If you don't like it, you don't renew your licensing. <laughs> so it's a, there's, a, there's an onus on Salesforce to make their customers successful 
So that sales force is successful as so well. So software as a service, it's not it's not that forces are buying kit. No, nope. it's it's buying the uh, to to uh, an extent the outcomes, the the information that's provided. Absolutely. Um, and if you think, Bernard, there's three key levers in a in a control room in policing that you can pull to make a change, and they sit across the breadth of effectiveness, efficiency, legitimacy. But I'm a strong believer in that it's better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. And often we start to do the wrong thing right with the right intentions and we put continuous improvement on the wrong thing but all you get is the wrong thing after and after and time after again. Uh, actually when you start to work out effectiveness and what's the right thing to do to then build in efficiencies and to build a leg legitimacy on the back of that you start to make real change. And those three levers are understanding demand and leveraging that failure demand to reduce the things that are coming in looking at capacity to make sure that capacity meets demand but also the capability of response so how long it takes you to deal with something as a member of staff and what i've seen in control rooms and across policing over the last eight years it's taken people longer and longer to do the same tasks and whilst complexity has gone up in policing no doubt about it and the things we're asking people to record technology companies should be enabling us to reduce failure demand reduce the time it takes staff to do what we're asking them to do and then capacity will sort itself out our go-to in policing often is more people, bigger rooms, fit more people in. But all we're doing, we're putting more people in to deal with failure demand, rather than the true value demand that the public need from us. Which, which brings me on to a topic that, that I'd, I'd hoped uh, that we would conclude on in, in this walk um, around Bramall Hall um, and the grounds here. Absolutely delightful. And that's, that's officer well-being, officer yes. and staff well-being. Now, if we just look around here, this is yeah. a wonderful environment birds chirping uh, people walking dogs the 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 stream flowing just at our uh, right hand side and uh, the, this the, the whole environment here is is wonderful to decompress yes. um, now the, the the nature of much of policing is it, it, it's a pressure cooker you it know is. you are um, responding and uh, you know, in, in no matter what environment, it, it might appear um, on the surface for some officers and staff that their, their jobs are perhaps less stress stressful. But actually, you know, there is stress in any, at any job. So how, uh, that, that, is, that is part of, of, of the consideration that you have. I would hope for yeah, hundred percent. And again, using Salesforce as that, we call it our one, one, one model. So how we give a percentage of our revenue uh, and the profit that we make back to doing good. How we give 1% of our staff's time to doing good. So I do volunteering work that's paid for via Salesforce, but giving back to do good. And actually how we use 1% of our technology for free to give back to doing good. And well-being for staff is something that's so close to my heart. And another reason that I came out, so actually you look at Team Police, you look at the Surfwell team uh, down in Devon and Cornwall, there's so many amazing initiatives going on and for me it's how Salesforce can help with that as well. Uh, you look at the Police Covenant that Andy Rhodes is doing and that work nationally around police wellbeing. If we don't talk about it, if we don't get it right, then whose problem is it? And when we say it's everybody's problem, that sometimes means it's nobody's problem. So there's a great position for me to use my, my current position now to affect and improve policing wellbeing nationally as well. And an opportunity there for uh, UK policing to um, disseminate knowledge and, and experience international and, yeah. and, and vice versa. This is a two-way process. Yeah. Learning uh, from others and uh, taking the opportunity to um, communicate with others the, the things that are working and indeed the things that aren't. Absolutely. So Andy, I'm just going to pause just here. Yeah. It's, <laughs> some might argue it's not the most scenic <laughs> part of our walk. We don't have the backdrop of Bramall Hall. No. We have, though, a beautiful wooded backdrop. And uh, I think on, on that note, Andy, just thank you so much for uh, introducing me to, to Bramall Hall, introducing yes. our viewers to Bramall Hall as yep. well. Very best luck, thank best you. of luck to you and your colleagues uh, and, and indeed your, your clients in the work that you are doing. Thank you, and thank, thank you to everything that you guys do as well, Bernard. It's amazing, thank you. Complete pleasure and thank you so much. Thank you. All the best.